This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. Well, it's my pleasure today in this episode to talk with Art Kramer. He's a friend and, and colleague that I've known for probably several decades now because of his work on effects of exercise on the brain. And currently, Art is um, a professor at Northeastern University and also uh, vice senior provost for research and graduate studies. So he's got a lot on his plate between mentoring his postdocs and students and, uh, and trying to enhance the, the research program at Northeastern. Uh, Art is an expert on brain function, various aspects of brain function from attention, uh, cognition in particular, different domains of cognition. He's looked at this from the standpoint of improving brain performance in healthy people, uh, in elderly people, and more recently uh, in children, with a lot of focus on physical exercise and particularly aerobic exercise and how it impacts the brain in a good way. And conversely, how a sedentary lifestyle may uh, lead to suboptimal brain performance. So our, wh why don't you start with your, your earlier work before you got into studying uh, brain function in elderly and children, you did some quite a bit of work on looking at different aspects of cognition and recording EEGs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So just, just one correction. I'm not a senior vice provost anymore. Oh. Uh, I, I saw the light and ah. found it as well founded a small center called the Center for Cognitive and Brain Health okay. uh, at Nor Northeastern and hired wonderful young colleagues. It's always great to have wonderful young colleagues who but all study cognitive and brain health from different perspectives. But, but to answer your question, uh, my early work on exercise and physical activity started in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. And first, in fact, the first paper I published was with a researcher by the name of Harold Hawkins, who was also a program manager at the Office of Naval Research. And Harold had, uh, I, I was just getting interested in the topic of exercise when I was at the University of Illinois. And Harold said to me, all right, I have this data I collected before I transitioned from academia uh, to, to the government, and would you like to look at it? And I had just proposed a few hypotheses and an NIH grant that fortunately got funded about the benefits for cognition from physical activity and exercise, even for older adults. And you know, for many years, we thought that once you're a senior citizen, it's a one-way trajectory in terms of cognition, in terms of brain health. Uh, that's clearly not true. And I'm certainly not the only one that's shown this. Many, many researchers have, uh, which is great news for us as, as we all age, that we can stay healthy and there are many ways to do it. And certainly one of those ways is exercise. So this initial study didn't even have any neuroimaging. It was purely behavioral. And the hypothesis that I had, and Harold had the data, which was amazing, which I then analyzed and, and published with Harold and, and a colleague of his, uh, was that uh, especially uh, aspects of cognition that we put under the heading of executive function, things like doing two tasks simultaneously, which we all do in this digital world, uh, working memory, focusing on some information in a noisy environment, be it verbal, or auditory, or visual, uh, would benefit and would benefit fairly substantially from the variety of improvements that you, Mark, and others have delineated with respect to brain health and, and uh, be it diet or, or exercise or other kinds of things. So I took a look at the data and amazingly, <laughs> which usually doesn't work out this way, uh, the data that Harold had collect, uh, collected was consistent with that. That is uh, elderly adults uh, tended to improve the most on the most difficult tasks. That is 
the ability to switch quickly among different skills. Think of it, a real world example would be driving where you're scanning for pedestrians and bicyclists, and of course, controlling the speed of the vehicle and worrying about other vehicles that are cutting you off. So lots of different tasks that you need to switch uh, among, and also time sharing, doing things simultaneously, which we often do as we work on the computer and might have several windows open and talk on Zoom or, uh, or on the phone or what have you. Uh, so that was my first foray uh, in with data I did not collect that Harold and his colleagues collected. And that was published in a journal called Psychology and Aging in 1992. Well, at the same time, we put in a proposal uh, to the National Institutes on Aging uh, to study this more formally. And uh, we, we collected uh, data. It was a, uh, a study that took about five years. It was uh, a year-long intervention, thinking that uh, uh, people have often said to me, why does it take so long to get benefits of exercise? Well, when you think about it, if you live your life in a sedentary fashion and you're now in your 70s, what is too long? Is six months or a year really too long to overcome what you've done? to yourself, the bad choices. We all make bad choices. I make plenty of mine. It's not in terms of exercise. I make other bad choices. But um, we were uh, able to collect a substantial amount of data, fairly large sample, uh, given sample sizes of humans were pretty small in these randomized controlled trials. And uh, I guess we got lucky because we published that study in Nature. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a bad publication. And then we went on and we added neuroimaging measures, uh, EEG or, or a part of EEG called event-related brain potentials, which are discrete responses to either aspects of cognition, could be memory, could be attention, could be reasoning, problem-solving, linguistic abilities, or uh, EEG, the ongoing electroencephalographic activity you can record from the, from the scalp with these little sensors called electrodes. And uh, we found over the years um, that a number of these indices of different aspects of cognition, one example is called the P300, occurs about 300 milliseconds after something happens, usually attending to something on the screen or auditorily or tactily, uh, actually uh, showed much more efficiency after people became more fit. And, and you know, be, be, all of our early work was with older adults. And uh, I'm often asked, well, um, you know, I, I couldn't uh, by, uh, I'm an older adult now, I'm, I'll be 69 years of age in, in a few weeks. And uh, people my age and older often say, well, you know, these people must be doing marathons. Well, they're not doing marathons. They're walking further and faster. And we often start our older adults out at 15 minutes and then gradually build up a few minutes every session, usually three sessions a week, so that after about two months, they're up to walking 45 minutes to an hour and, and at a good pace, you know, it's think of it as power walking. And most of these folks have never done this in their life and they're starting in their seventies and, and their eighties. And um, as a result of these, these changes, you see neuroelectric as well as other neuroimaging measures of increased brain efficiency. Uh, and you also see improvements in aspects of memory, executive function, functioning, uh, something called processing speed that Tim Salthouse at, at Virginia has popularized, that is responding quickly, but also accurately, uh, and a variety of other cognitive abilities. Uh, later, we, we switched to um, using MRI and fMRI to look at the anatomy to the extent we can do that. Of course, we don't have the resolution that you would have in animal research because none of our subjects has ever volunteered for the histology. So we don't do histology, we just do relatively non-invasive. It's, it's a little noisy to go into the bore of an MRI machine and sometimes cold. So we give people blankets, uh, but we also show changes, which is pretty remarkable in the anatomy, often the volume or the integrity of the interconnections among different brain regions, that is uh, the white matter, the axons. And these days we, we look at functional activity in a fairly sophisticated way. It's called connectivity analysis. And essentially what it allows us to do is look at how different regions of the brain coordinate and communicate with each other as you're trying to remember a string of words or trying to reason uh, about uh, the various attributes you might consider in buying a new automobile or buying a condo or a home or, or what have you. 
So there are a number of these neural networks, as they're called, that have been defined in the literature, and we can find more efficiency, more connectivity, because interestingly, we know that as we age, the connectivity of these networks tends to decrease. This also happens in various pathologies. And as a function of exercise, the connectivity actually increases. And those increases in connectivity predict better aspects of cognition. So there's a relationship between structure, integrity of white matter, often volume of gray matter, connectivity, so that different regions communicate more effectively, and, and cognition. And occasionally, uh, because I'm never satisfied with just the laboratory tasks, they tend to be very focused, which is great because we can study aspects, different aspects of cognition. But I, I'm always left wondering, does any of this relate to the real world? Uh, how, how do we know whether there are benefits to translate uh, for people in their lives, not just for scientists in their labs, these pretty pictures of, of, of brain networks and so forth. So we've often done a number of uh, real world tasks. Uh, I've been involved in virtual reality for more than a few years and continue to do that. So we simulate situations that would be completely unethical uh, to do in the real world. One of these simulations was having people cross streets and uh, we make it really, really challenging. Uh, being somebody who got run over by two cars, I can tell you that you don't want to get hit by cars, but in the virtual reality, uh, you can run people over, the screen can turn blood red, and you can make it challenging such that you ask them to do things we do anyway, not smart things, but things we do like talk on the cell phone or uh, do other things that are distracting and not paying attention to the traffic in a city like Boston that has lots of pedestrian vehicle accidents every year, Boston and Cambridge. Unfortunately, other cities do too in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and what we found is that by requiring people to do this multitasking, either listen to music, which people do as they're walking down the street and crossing streets, uh, or talking to someone else, it could be a spouse, a partner for children, because we've now done a lot of work with young children, it could be their mom or dad, we find that those who are higher fit and become higher fit tend to be more successful in multitasking in a simulated real world task, that is the ability to cross the street and not get run over as I did. So I, I guess I need more training because I certainly don't want to get run over again. It hurts and recovery takes a while. Uh, so with kids, uh, do you want me to continue with the kids or stop now? Uh, I, I was going to ask a question on, um, so I often look at these things from an evolutionary perspective and, and we, mm -hmm. we evolve moving physically through our environment mm -hmm. while we're learning and remembering things and, you know, interacting with other individuals or, you know, whatever in our environment. And so, and you're having the people do walking through an environment. Mm -hmm. What about, I've often wondered if the effects of that on cognitive domains may be stronger than someone just sitting on a stationary bike or on a treadmill and, and not actually moving through an environment. Yeah, there, uh, that's a really interesting question. There haven't been enough comparisons. I mean, all these ex uh, experiments are expensive and time consuming uh, because I can't just recruit a number of rodents, unfortunately. I know that it's got its ups and downs too, but uh, you know, people uh, make a commitment often of six months or a year to participate in these programs and it's costly to collect the data. MRI data yeah. collection is quite expensive. And now we collect positron emission tomography data, which is much more expensive to look at beta amyloid and tau, precursors for Alzheimer's and so forth. Um, so there certainly are studies with different kinds of exercise. Uh, most of the studies with older folks are running or jogging, uh, sorry, walking or jogging. Um, some of them are using a bicycle, actually a real bicycle on the road, which is of course more challenging because you have to pay attention to the environment than stationary bikes, some stationary bikes. And then uh, other kinds of things like swimming. And there aren't many uh, uh, studies of kind of long distance swimming for a half an hour, an hour, but there are some and they all tend to produce similar results, but it would be nice to do a head to head comparison with all yeah. of these different conditions. I, There's even, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, in a recent episode, I, 
uh, had um, Jim Kinnear uh -huh. and Hopkins who studies cognitive maps and you know mm -hmm. spatial learning and memory and the circuitry and the hippocampus involved in that and you, you're probably aware that the interesting study a long time ago in London where cab drivers had yeah, larger sure. hippocampus you know so they're physically moving through their environment and now people are using well that's another thing you know people use gps now and so they actually don't have to really pay attention to where they're going anymore and i'm just kind of wondering whether these different whether actually moving through your environment and thinking about where you're going has a bigger impact for example you'd think so at least on those hippocampal circuits yeah i i would think so also i don't know the head-to-head -head, uh, comparisons with humans anyway uh, with animals, you could do it too. Uh, I, I used to, like, like many people, I thought putting an animal on a running wheel was yeah. a little artificial. And then yeah. there was that paper that came out a number of years ago where the researchers put running wheels in the forest and the animals <laughs> got in the running wheel and ran. I never would have thought that would happen. I thought they'd have other reasons to run than, than running around the running wheel. But, but nonetheless, I think we need more of these experiments. One of the studies we're running now which is something I've been thinking about for a while, but I didn't quite have the technology to do it, is looking at the uh, separate and combined effects of being exposed to nature versus an urban environment. There's more and more literature that suggests that being exposed to nature uh, will enhance feelings of well being, psychosocial function, emotion, but also cognition. In fact, uh, one researcher out at the University of Utah, which is, of course, a great place to be in nature out in, uh, outside of Salt Lake City, uh, found that uh, individuals' creativity on these objective measures of, of generating creative solutions to problems uh, increased 50% by spending a week in nature, which is remarkable. Wow. Nothing increases 50%. It's very rare. And others have found this too. People like John Janides and Berman and uh, University of Michigan and University of Chicago. So uh, I was interested in exactly what you're saying, whether environment is important. So what we've done is take something called an omnidirectional treadmill, which is a circular treadmill, looks kind of weird, it's not like any other uh, treadmill, and it has bands that as you walk, or you could actually even jog, it brings you back to the center. So it allows you to walk in infinite space, and then you have uh, VR goggles on, so we can put you in a forest, which we do, or put you in a city. We started out with Indianapolis, because I was close to Indy, at one time, but now it's kind of an artificial city with lots of factories and buildings, not quite as pretty as being in the, in the forest. And uh, we have people doing essentially orienteering tasks. We have people uh, reading a map. So they have a virtual map in front of them that they hold out and they can see through their VR goggles that give them stereo vision and they're given clues and they have to go from one location to the other and they're ambulating around, be it in the city, uh, with right angles or the forest where you can, can can go at any angle and picking up clues that'll get them to the next uh, way station. And what we're doing is that we have people that are either walking on this omnidirectional treadmill or jogging, and we're doing it with both college students and with older adults at present, <laughs> or people that are transported. So Mark, if you were walking, I would be transported. If you remember the old Star Trek in which you could yeah. transport people from sure. one location to the other. Uh, I might be the person that's transported, but at the same rate that you're walking. So we yoke people together. But if I'm being transported, I'm just standing on the treadmill and I'm moving through the space as oh, if I'm yeah, in Star yeah. Trek. So this control. way, we, yeah, control. this way, we, yeah, we can deconvolve the effects of physical activity yeah. from exposure to different kinds of environments, wow. environments like nature environments that have been uh, been found to produce benefits, uh, both with behavior, but also some EEG studies by a number of researchers. So I am very interested in environment and the challenges that you encounter in environments, for example, doing an orienteering task where you, you get clues and then you have a little virtual compass and you have to, and how many people use a compass these days, right? Because we have GPS, and uh, I mean, years ago, I, I always loved the cab driver study. Uh, I think it was McGuire was the first author that came out of London because what they found was the cab drivers tended to increase the size of their hippocampi on the left and right. 
but bus drivers didn't. Well, bus drivers drive the same route every day. Oh, yeah. Whereas cab drivers, you know, they, they pick up a passenger. The passenger wants them to be efficient and not get stuck in the in the rush hour traffic. I was, uh, as they call us years ago, I was a hack or a cab driver in New York City as a young man for two summers. So I, I really learned that you really learned the city very well. And you need a reasonably good memory because I didn't have any GPS in yeah. the 1970s. You just and, and- had to learn what. Yeah. And the other thing is the, with the cab drivers, you know, at least when I'm in a cab, at least alone, I, I talk with the cab driver, right? Right. So right. they're they're kind of multitasking in that sense, too. They're talking to someone while they're thinking. Yeah. About, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Whereas a bus driver, they drive the same route probably tens of thousands of times in their career, right? They tend not to vary yeah. uh, very much, if at all. I was also a truck driver, so I drove long haul cross country as a young man. That's oh, the way I supported myself through college. I lived in New York and drove out to California, drove down to Florida, and and there you're dealing with so many factors. And you know, being a truck driver, you're not always in the best of shape. But I, the kind of truck driver I was, uh, I did household moving, so I was lifting pianos of five floor walk ups in Brooklyn. So I had plenty of exercise, and then I drove the truck. But you're also fatigued. You're going places you've never been before. It, you often can't see that well because you're driving in the middle of the night so that you can get to the location and unload. And weather, weather issues. Oh, God. Yeah, I still remember hanging out a window once because my windshield wipers broke and using my hand to scrape off the snow. Not the smartest thing to do, but it was better than not scrape, scrape off the snow. So, yeah, I think environment is is got to be important uh, given the complexity of, of, of what's required in some environments. Even driving, you know, we often, and I've done a lot of driving research over the years. I'm actually doing some today, looking at um, what people call mind wandering. Uh, when we're driving, we often get home, but don't even realize how we did it if we go on a familiar route, which isn't the safest thing to do because even though the route may be familiar, the pedestrians and bicyclists certainly aren't familiar because they're not there at the same time every day. And, you know, people have these accidents and, and they say, well, a driver will have these accidents. And this is what exactly what the driver said when they ran me over on Commonwealth Avenue. We didn't see him. I was in the middle of the crosswalk. What do you mean you didn't see me? But they're paying attention to something else, listening to the radio. I think they were talking on the phone. I don't have any proof of that. Uh, so there are many other things we do in environments that, that take our mind uh, out of the environment. Even if you know, people say to me, well, you, when you cross the road, you have to look right at the driver. But there are many examples, uh, some of it by, again, by Dave Strayer in Utah, who, who have these, uh, I guess the defini- definition is look but see, uh, look but not see accidents, where he's tracking people's eyes. They look right at the bicyclist, and then in the virtual simulation, they run the bicyclist over. So just because the eyes are pointed in the mm-hmm. right direction doesn't mean the brain has gotten the information in an appropriate amount of time to take the response that's needed. Yeah, I, I used to race motocross. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, there's like 40 riders in a race. And so I'm very good at kind of estimating speed and and kind of the angle and, you know, whether mm-hmm. someone's accelerating or not. And so I kind of just look at the, look at the car and kind of judge yeah. Is it slowing down for the stuff? <laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly do that now. I don't pay attention. I mean, the traffic lights are great. I, I, in Boston, I think they're advisory at best. People don't always follow them. So you make sure the car is slowing down before you step off into the, into the crosswalk, which people aren't supposed to run you over. But this is something else we have in common. When I was a teenager, my brother and I would switch off. One of us was the mechanic and the other one was the rider. And we did motocross and flat track. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah I... And a place, co- place called Bridgehampton was the motocross out on the end of Long Island in New York. And then there was a track in Freeport. Uh, my brother wound up doing more motocross. And I like to go really fast uh, and uh, lay down the bike on the corner. Yeah. So I was a flat tracker. Yeah, there's a famous track in New York, Unadilla. Uh-huh. And... Um... Yeah, I'm from Minnesota, so I raced on a track that's still one, it's one of the tracks where they have national rounds each year. And mm. it, it just mm. turns out by happenstance, several, one, two, three, four, four or five of the 
best motocross riders in the United States were from Minnesota over the last. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, well, let's, yeah let's, I actually I've, I've done street riding, too. And I gave up. I had two bikes in Champaign, an 86 Harley Sportster and a 72 Triumph uh, Bonnie, a Bonneville. And I gave them up when I moved to Boston because I thought, look at my age, because I moved here at 63. I'll be dead in no time if I'm trying to ride in the streets of Boston. Yeah, no, I never got a street bike. It's too dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. Yeah. So let's let's get back to the sure the main thing. So you've shown and in, in, in many studies, and there's others uh, others who've looked at this too that mm -hmm. uh, brain performance can be enhanced by over time by exercise mm -hmm. in different domains in elderly and adults. More recently, you've done a lot of work with children and. So in talking about this, I think parents who are listening to this are the, are the ones that should take note. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As you know, in, in the United States, there, there's, there's some disparity across states in childhood obesity, mm -hmm. uh, type 2 diabetes, and those disparities, you know, it's the southern states mainly, where there's high incidents of that and the people there families there tend to be more sedentary and taking too many calories and one of my concerns and i think yours too is that how can we help these kids you know not become obese or if they are getting overweight help them get their weight down but you know, you and I are concerned about the brains of these kids and and their academic performance. So can you talk about your work on exercise and cognition, academic performance in children? Absolutely. Um, when I was a child and a high school student, uh, I was a jock. So I, I never knew what group I fed into because I was also somewhat of a nerd, I guess a nerd jock. <laughs> and I participated in many sports. My dad, some of them good for my brain, some of them not. I did track and field, pole vaulting and running. Uh, but I was also a boxer and a martial artist. Not so good for the <laughs> brain. So I'm lucky I can still string a few words together in a sentence at my age. But I guess I am lucky in many ways. But, you know, there was this notion when I was in high school and I was in one of these high schools you tested into. So you were expected to mm -hmm. do well, even if you were a jock, was... Uh, Kind of the dumb jock hypothesis if you participated in sports you didn't oh, spend yeah. enough time on academics and what the evidence suggests that, that you've asked about and i'll tell you a little bit about the studies we've done is it's the inverse of the dumb jock hypothesis so we look at young people and this you know ranges from seven years of age to you know teenage years in many of our studies and then we look at young adults too college age students uh, but what we find is those that are physically fit, and we often use look at aerobic fitness, although there's strength that benefits you and, and some Eastern practices like yoga and Tai Chi tend to be beneficial. I've done some work with uh, Indian and, and Chinese colleagues uh, on some of these practices that are much more popular in, in the East than they are in the West, but becoming popular here. But what we find is that the children who are more fit, who participate in sports or just participate in activities with their parents. It could be hiking, it could be walking around the neighborhood, it could be swimming or bicycling as a family. I mean, there are many, many options, of course. Uh, these kids tend to do better in ach on achievement tests. So that's the objective real-time evidence for kids, whereas we've used VR. Uh, we're also doing a VR experiment with kids, I'll tell you about in a second, but uh, what, we, and by we, I mean Chuck Hillman and I, Chuck came from Illinois with me and he's always worked with kids. And then I started working with kids with Chuck and, and the students and postdocs. What we found is that not only do, do you see cognitive benefits on these um, computerized cognitive tasks, not only do you see uh, a benefits in EEG in terms of timing and, and uh, resolution of various components, or even in terms of connectivity, because uh, we use MRI and fMRI with children uh, these days, uh, but you find real world, real world benefits. And most of our real world associations are performance and standardized academic tasks that the kids who uh, go through these training programs and uh, 
there have been a number of them that have been funded by NIH called Fit Kids One, Two, and so forth. And they tend to be year long or nine month program that mirror the school year, their after school programs. And you know, with young, with older people, you can really focus on a particular kind of exercise like walking or bicycling or swimming. With kids, you know, good luck if you're going to try to do that. They need to be entertained a little bit more. So what we tend to do is, is create games to keep them moving for an hour to two hours a day after school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could say, well, the games are social, absolutely, because the kids play together. And the games are also intellectual because you have to learn the rules and so forth. And that's all true. So I wouldn't say it's just exercise, but it most certainly is exercise. These are often children who haven't moved much, who have sat on a couch and played video games, and now they're playing with other kids, and they're learning rules and so forth, and they're moving for two hours a day, and we tend to do it three to five days a week after school, nice. and uh, they loved it in Champaign, Illinois, because the school bus would take them to, uh, to the gym, and uh, you can think of it as free, really good babysitting for the parents for a couple of hours <laughs> after school concludes. Uh, Boston's a little bit more challenging because, of course, transportation here is, but we do it here, too. Uh, so what we found is that the, the children uh, tend to benefit in all of the same ways and some more in terms of academic achievement, uh, standardized test scores uh, than the older adults. But, you know, we might expect that, too, because we know how many years of decades have we known that younger brains, whether they're from a mouse, a rat or a human, tend to be a bit more plastic. And uh, we can also hopefully intervene in terms of health issues, as you're pointing out. You know, these days we have 10 year olds with hypertension and type two diabetes. And we, and we don't even know, we've never seen this before uh, because when we grew up, I mean, I, I, uh, I grew up in New York and there were only three TV channels and they went off at like 10, 10 o'clock at night anyway. So you went out and, and ran around and played stickball and did other things with your friends. And there weren't any video games, so there wasn't that option. Uh, you know, you could read books and study, which we did occasionally too. But uh, it is interesting to see that wherever you look in the lifespan, you see these benefits. Recently, we've been collaborating uh, with some folks in Granada, Spain, at the University of Granada. And uh, they had proposed studying obese children in Spain. And I thought to myself when I first hear this, heard this, uh, are there really obese children? children in Spain. I know they're obese, but yeah, they're obese children everywhere. So we've done studies with just obese children and the benefits there can be even larger yeah. uh, of, of getting them more active because these children tend not to be very active and tend to eat. Of course, in Europe, I know we eat smaller meals than the United States. We like our big portions here, you know, our buffets. Although I think the pandemic has slowed that down a little bit, uh, which is probably a good thing for our, our health in some ways. But uh, kids benefit. We've also done studies with college students and uh, in multimodal interventions that were included a number of different interventions, different groups in both uh, separate groups and combined mindfulness training, cognitive training, fitness training. And uh, we've looked at uh, the main outcome variable there was reasoning and problem solving, what we all, all uh, pretty much call fluid intelligence. And we consider it an aspect of our intelligence, which, which it is. And we found even the, the 20 to 30 somethings uh, benefited. And of all of these different interventions, the biggest benefit came from uh, increased fitness. So our, going back to the, the studies where you, you have the children, you know, and they do these games for an hour or two after mm -hmm. school. And you mentioned you look at aerobic fitness, VO2 max, essentially. Yes, we do. Right. Yeah. And so with it, within, and you mentioned, well, there's also social interactions and mm -hmm. cognitive. Uh, within the group of, of kids, is there a correlation between VO2 max and performance? Because that would kind of argue that there's an exercise effect that's at least somewhat independent of social interactions or? Absolutely. And we don't always find that, but we usually find that with both children and with older adults. We had a paper in PNAS back a number of years ago, in 2011, I think, where we found a nice correlation between older adults uh, in terms of improvement in VO2 max, the gold standard for cardiorespiratory fitness, 
and uh, spatial memory, something that would tap hippocampus and also hippocampal volume uh, in, in the older adults. So you often find these correlations. You know, there's, there's a lot of noise. I remember when I first started doing these studies with humans uh, and I thought to myself, you know, even if these effects exist, will I be able to see them? Will I have the sensitivity in the experimental designs to see them? And I also remember uh, one of our colleagues, Carl Kotman, years ago telling me, oh, Art, this is great. This human stuff is great. I, I'm going to do some human studies. And I said, Carl, watch what you wish for, because with your rodents, you control their life. You even control their genome. Right. I control virtually nothing. Yeah. You know, I have people, the older adults come into the gym three, three days a week for like an hour, hour and 15 minutes. You control the rodents' lives. I can do a, only a minimal amount for people, and uh, I can't control their genetics either. I don't control any of that. And what they what they do when they leave me, uh, you can feed the animals appropriate diets if you're interested in high fat versus low fat. If, like you, Mark, you're interested in caloric restriction, you can do that. I can't do any of that. Yeah. All I can do is ask them to come in and uh, teach them how to how to do their uh, blood pressure and their heart rate and ask them to do it within a, an appropriate range given where they're at. So there's got to be so much noise in this human data yeah. just because they've lived their lives and we don't control anything about them. And we've yeah. also no. found some some funny things. For example, we wrote a paper a number of years ago and we've also we've told the participants in our studies, look, you can't do anything wrong. You might be in this group and you might be in the control group, which is often toning and stretching, or you might be in the aerobic group, the walking group, the swimming group, the bicycle group, whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't do anything wrong in the study. So we asked them to keep a diary of the things they did outside uh, of the experiment, outside of the gym, outside of the testing and so forth. And what we found is that uh, especially people who had been sedentary for most of their life got really excited about being physically active. And we had what we'd call crossovers. We had people who were in one group, maybe in the toning and stretching group and decided, hey, this feels great. I'm gonna start walking or bicycling. And, and how can you tell somebody, you know, this goes to the ethics of our research. You can't tell somebody not to do something that we know is good for their health. I mean, we're exploring effects on brain, but we know it's good for the body. We know it's good for, uh, all kinds of things down to the molecular biology, the mitochondria, the telomeres, on and on and on. So I can't tell somebody don't do it. So what we did is have them keep a diary. And we found that people tended to cross boundaries because they got excited. That's great, but it's a little harder to interpret the data. That's the downside. But so the, the fact that despite the variability in the group yeah. of hum humans and their genetics, and their life experiences, you're picking out these effects on yes. cognition, uh, neural network activity in the brain, even, even the size of gray and white matter changes. In mm -hmm. So that actually that argues for strong effects, very strong effects of exercise. Right, if we can see it through all the, all the noise. Yeah. I, you know, I also used to think when I started this, well, the behavioral effects, the effects on the computer-based cognitive tasks will probably be larger than the, than the neuroimaging, be it neural electric or hemodynamic or, you know, whatever, whatever technique, there are lots of techniques you can use. And we found just the opposite. Huh. We found that the effects occur earlier and are stronger with the uh, neuroimaging measures. And, you know, so when I think about it in retrospect, you can say, well, that's closer to what we were interested in, isn't it? Isn't it an extra inferential step to go to behavior and then infer brain? Yeah. Why not just measure brain? So you can argue it either way, but I also knew, having been trained from graduate school in human EEG, that these measures can be pretty noisy. You know, you have to average uh, multiple trials to get a stability and, or use, these days you would use, as we do and everybody does these days, uh, machine learning techniques to to, uh, to filter out some of the noise. But nonetheless, we've generally found uh, across both children and uh, young adults and older adults and also patient groups that the neuroimaging data uh, is stronger than the behavioral data. But then, then you think about the behavioral data and you know that's got its weaknesses too. We, we may have tests that tap memory, 
I've always thought of the water, uh, Morris water maze, which I know you and others have used as really a dirty test of memory in a way, because it, it measures memory, but the animals are more than a little stressed when you try to drown them. I know you're not trying to drown them, but they might think you're trying to drown them. Who knows? So it's, uh, I think of it as, as not a very pure test of memory because there's all this stress and trying to find the platform. And we you do know, the same thing to humans too. So. Actually, I thought about that when you were talking about the virtual reality and the people crossing the road dodging cars, because I was thinking, right. I wonder if they have a stress response during that. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, that street crossing task, which we uh, designed and implemented at the University of Illinois, we had a very good VR group and I've been working with them for many years and I, I continue to do some VR work. I, I was a little concerned about uh, whether older folks, I thought kids would get right into it and it yeah. would be a video game. Okay, because that's how they grew up. But people in their 70s and 80s and even us, uh, you know, we, we played pinball, but we didn't play video games when we were young because it didn't exist. And, and the interesting thing is, the uh, it, it's just observational, but we found uh, we didn't have a harness at first that people wore when they were on the treadmill because we had the handles, you know, that you would have on a treadmill in a gym. But our treadmill. So, so you mean uh, was, you, you weren't measuring heart rate? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I, I meant we didn't take enough safety precautions. Uh, I, I wasn't worried about people falling off the treadmill because they could hold on to it as they were oh. walking. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, no harm, no foul. Uh, the woman didn't get hurt. But an 80 year old woman was so scared when she was crossing the street on the treadmill in the VR facility. She jumped off the back and fell down. We're lucky she didn't get hurt. But but I never would have thought that. Yeah. But it was so immersive for her and for many of the older people. I think because it wasn't a video game, you They're know, not they, adapted they, to it. Yeah. No. So that is a, that's also a concern, but we have older people now on our omnidirectional treadmill and our VR goggles, and we do have a harness on everybody. We don't allow anybody to flop on the ground anymore. I don't want any broken hips. Um, and they really enjoy it. It takes a while to learn. It's a different environment, kind of like being in the matrix, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's new for the older adults. Yeah. I guess in, in the last part of this, our, our conversation, let's talk a little bit about looking a little deeper in the brain and animal studies. And mm -hmm. you've tried to look at some, some changes in uh, particular protein. We'll talk about BDNF. Mm -hmm. um, so the animal studies, as you mentioned, a lot of the animal studies with exercise are using running, having running wheels in the cage. There's mm -hmm. some with treadmill studies. And mm -hmm. as you also mentioned, in the case of the animals, you can euthanize them, take their brain out, cut it in slices, look at it. So several reproducible findings have been found in the animal studies. One is in the hippocampus. Uh, in this one particular part of the hippocampus, there are stem cells that can give rise to new neurons. And the exercise has a robust effect in increasing mm -hmm. the, the production and incorporation in the neural networks of mm -hmm. uh, the, the stimulated stem cells. Another effect of exercise is in strengthening synaptic connections mm -hmm. between neurons. And that's measured by actually putting electrodes in mm -hmm. a presynaptic neuron or a stimulatory stimulating electrode in a presynaptic neuron, a recording electrode in a postsynaptic neuron, and simply measuring the strength of the postsynaptic response. Mm -hmm. So there's some evidence for strengthening and maybe even increasing synapse numbers, mm -hmm. at least in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Correlated with that, there's an increase in levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which there's now well over a thousand, probably several thousand publications with studying BDNF. It's produced by neurons in, when they're active. Mm -hmm. And I guess we didn't really talk about this. During exercise, there are certainly some neurons in your brain that are more active. Mm -hmm. Actually, many neurons, not just neurons mm -hmm. in the sensory motor system, but... right. If you're moving through the environment, definitely neurons in the hippocampus, mm -hmm. where, where most of these effects of exercise have been studied in animals. 
-hmm. And um, so BDNF increases robustly with exercise in animals. BDNF is known to play an important role in learning and memory, mm -hmm. an important role in promoting the maintenance and formation of new synaptic connections. And also in, in studies we've done in uh, increasing resilience of the neurons, that is their resistance to stress, which I guess we could also talk about. Uh, sure, yeah. But um, why don't you talk about your studies uh, measuring BDNF in, in blood samples? Um, yeah. It, it can be measured actually in cerebrospinal fluid if you take a spinal tap. I don't know if that's been done with any exercise studies in humans. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, CSF has been examined. It is being examined now, of course, for uh, precursors for plaques and tangles, right? For amyloid, beta, and tau. But I, I don't know that anybody's looked at BDNF with response, uh, respect to exercise. It's true. We've looked at BDNF in blood and blood biomarkers. I remember when I first started doing this, I think it was Carl Kotman. It could have been Rusty Gage. I don't know. And I told him, they said, oh, that's going to be so dirty. And I said, I know it's dirty. But you, would you volunteer for me to take a little biopsy of your hippocampus? campus so I can look for BDNF there. That's not doable in humans, guys, and you know it. Uh, I mean, oh, there is a technique. Art, called... uh, let, me, let me interject it. Oh, it is? Okay. Oh, it is. It's kind of indirectly possible, and okay. there's something called a liquid biopsy. Ah. There, are, there are small, very small vesicles, like 50 to 100 nanometers mm -hmm. in diameter that are released from cell, all cells. Uh, and these are called exosomes or extracellular mm -hmm. vesicles. And a colleague of mine at, at NIA, Dimitros Kapagianis, him and another guy developed methods where they take an antibody against a protein that's produced mm -hmm. by neurons, but not other cells. Mm -hmm. And then first they isolate all the exosomes from the blood sample. And then they use that antibody to pull mm -hmm. out of that big pool of exosomes, those uh, exosomes that they think are coming from neurons. Hmm. And, it's, and it's actually not a complicated thing. Hmm. So I'll get you in contact with Demetrios because I think he'd be happy be to, great. to yeah. collaborate with you. You could, you probably got bank blood from these people. We, we do have bank we do have bank blood from a, a lar the largest RCT ever on exercise and aging six hundred. Yeah, so he he could, he could yeah. you could send him a sample. He could pull out these neuron derived exosomes, and we could you could measure BDNF. He's been looking at insulin resistance, uh -huh. so he looks at the insulin. There's a protein that associates with the insulin receptor. It's called IRS. Uh huh. And Anyway, he, he's got methods he can kind of tell, indirectly tell where there's brain or at least neuronal insulin resistance hmm. by looking at these vesicles, which yeah. is also very relevant to the exercise. Absolutely. Well, that's great to know. That's not something okay. I knew. And, and uh, when we write our next large grant and we want another 30 million from NIH, which yeah. we have now, where it would be great to, you know, we do have banked blood. And one of the problems with all the blood we've banked is, you know, there are better and better techniques to get at many analytes these days and to do uh, GWAS and to, to look at uh, precursors for plaques and, and tangles in the blood, but none of them are cheap. So we're still yeah. struggling to get the extra money, the extra funds we need. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the National Institutes of Health has given us over 35 million to do the study, but it's a huge study. I mean, it's 650 participants at multiple sites, Pittsburgh, Kansas, and Boston, uh, year-long exercise with positron emission tomography, with CSF, with blood biomarkers, with MR and fMRI behavior, on and on and on. So it's super thorough. Yeah. And we will be done with that study at the end of this year, which will be really neat. We will, have, right. Good. We'll have more than 650 older participants at it's got to provide great data. And we do have some bank blood because we took blood before at six months and at 12 months at the conclusion of the study. And right now, we don't have the money to actually analyze the six-month data. So it'd be interesting to, 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 uh, to look at a couple of subjects. And then, of course, if you can get promising data, 
hopefully NIH would be generous, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and help pay for the costs. That's always the key. So that's great to know. Thank you. So oh, that, maybe we can can do a better job, but all of our uh, uh, BDNF, IGF one, and VEGF has been from blood. And well, uh, what, this this technology I just mentioned is very recent. You you wouldn't have known about it, you know, at the time. Probably we wrote the grant. Yeah. 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 So, what did you find with BDNF? We kind of got a little ab absolutely. So uh, we found uh, with BDNF and also IGF one, another nerve growth oh. factor. That uh, and we've looked at VEGF too. Uh, we've found that similar kinds of things to what animal researchers find. That is, when you increase uh, fitness through uh, often walking or jogging uh, with our samples, you increase uh, the amount of BDNF that we can extract from the blood. Again, it could be peripheral, could be CNS, a lot of issues here for sure. Yeah. And those increases in BDNF, we, I have a plot in one of the, one of the PowerPoints I, I, uh, I show at talks, those increases in BDNF are correlated with increases in connectivity in a number of brain networks, which are correlated with improvements in cognition. Wow. So a lot of the same things that you find, what I've been trying to do for years, and of course, our measures are a lot cruder than the measures you can use with animals because of the limitations, of course, uh, a lot less crude in measuring cognition, but a lot cruder in measuring brain for sure. Uh, what I've been trying to do is bring the animal research and the human research closer together uh, by using some of these techniques given their limitations. And now it sounds like fewer limitations, which is always fantastic with humans and seeing very similar effects, of course, from our cruder measurements. Now, in addition to its important role in cognition, uh, BDNF, there's quite a bit of evidence that plays a very important role in mood. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, uh, people with depression, the, the common treatments now are these serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake mm -hmm. inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And it turns out those drugs increase BDNF levels, at mm -hmm. least in animals. And studies have shown, and we, we can kind of test depressive like behaviors in rats or mice. Mm -hmm. And studies have shown that if you reduce BDNF levels uh, in animals, the antidepressant effects of these drugs is largely eliminated, mm -hmm. suggesting that the increase in BDNF is actually mm -hmm. essential. So mm -hmm. it's very possible that these mechanisms we're talking about related to cognition are also responsible mm -hmm. for enhancement of mood with exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, anxiety disorders, depression are increasingly common. Exercise is, at least anecdotally, but I think there's also studies showing this, uh, exercise is a good antidepressant Yes. Yeah, there are studies showing that more and more. Yeah. And it's interesting because I have one of the uh, four faculty members we hired in building this Center for Cognitive and Brain Health at Northeastern is Sue Whitfield Gabrielli. And you might know her husband, John, yeah. but uh, she is equally uh, as amazing as John. In fact, better educated than my friend John Gabrielli because Sue is ABD in mathematics from Stanford and a PhD in neuroscience from Berkeley. So she's very well educated. And she's developed a lot of the mathematics, the algorithms for connectivity analysis in human brains. And she's recently been doing and developing these real-time fMRI feedback techniques and using them with training, often mindfulness training with uh, depressive patients and finding that in real time, I mean, within seconds of, of measuring uh, success at using some of these techniques to reduce depression, to increase well-being, and so forth, uh, that she can show these um, improvements on mood and anxiety and depressive symptoms uh, with patient groups. And just recently, by recently, I mean this morning, uh, we've been talking about this for a while, but Sue said, wouldn't it be neat if we compared the relative benefits both separately and in a combination synergistic effects of exercise, and she likes to work with kids, adolescents, uh, in terms of depression and anxiety, which is a huge problem and a bigger problem because of the pandemic, of course. Yeah. Uh, but wouldn't it be great 
and we have talked about this over the last couple of years, but haven't done it yet. We're so busy with the stuff we're doing, but uh, wouldn't it be great if we could look at the separate and combined effects of real-time fMRI feedback in a mindfulness training program for children with high levels of anxiety and depression and compare that to both uh, a separate program of physical activity or exercise and a combined program of physical activity and e real-time fMRI-based feedback um, in, uh, in some of these children. And I think it would be great. The question is to find the time. The, the Welcome Foundation just came out with an RFP and uh, they're very interested in different approaches to adolescent anxiety and depression, of course, because it's a huge international problem. Yeah. So we, we, may, we may write that white paper and see what they think about it. Uh, if we can find the time, I'm just, you know, we're trying to hire eight people this semester, eight new people into our group, which is crazy. I mean, it's, it, <laughs> uh, and we just had two of the senior people from the UC system. Uh, they're visiting us today, actually, we're visiting us yesterday. And you know, all you have to do without all the support, yeah, we're supposed to also get a $10 million check from our president for uh, kinds of positions that are difficult to put on NIH grants. You know, they're, they're limited, some things you can do, some things you can't do. So I'm the director of all this. And all I do these days, I feel like is write spreadsheets and uh, deal with the accountants, the president's accountants. And then of course, interview all these people but I think we're going to be able to make six to eight offers, which is I've never done from one search. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're all kind of busy involved in this, but hopefully we can find the time to, you know, to write a uh, white paper or letter of intent or whatever you want to call it. I think it would be good to finish up with uh, just, uh, your thoughts on the, the healthcare system and, and how, how do we get, to improve the the fitness and you know whole body and brain health, particularly of children, but also adults, given the kind of the way the system set up is, you know, a patient develops some you know indicators that they're likely to develop type two diabetes. So, for example, they're getting to be overweight insulin resistant and there's no real mechanisms to get these people to to adopt a, a better lifestyle. the current thing is you let the person develop diabetes then you give yeah. them a drug mm -hmm. uh, you know and and how do we get educate parents about the importance of this for their kids health including their brain health and performance. It's a big problem. I don't have the answers, but yeah. yeah. Well, I don't Henry, know that uh, any of us have the answer, but I, I think there are a number of ways, uh, a number of um, procedures and techniques we need to pursue to, to help with that. So Chuck is Chuck Hillman, my colleague, has been part of an HHS panel uh, to look into this for kids, for policy changes by the government. And one of those policy changes could be uh, in terms of what we require of insurance companies, uh, HMOs, PPOs, in terms of more preventive care rather than just, you're right, it's often retrospective and the, then you've got the disease and it tends to be much more difficult to treat and probably even much more difficult to get people, convince people to change their behavior. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing some work recently and I've been on an NIH panel, a Roybal Center panel, which Margie Lackman uh, runs here and she's at Brandeis in Boston. And it's a panel specifically focused on behavioral change with respect to physical activity. Because, you know, as I tell people when they say, what's the hardest thing to, about the research you've done? I say, well, the neuroscience is easy. The hardest thing is getting people to change their behavior. That's yeah. hard. And, yeah. and uh, so this particular Roybal Center, which I've been part of for the last six years and had some support, but uh, I'm on the executive council, which is more important to me because you help to formulate ideas for others. And, and, and we give out grant money, which is great. So you can try to move the field a little bit is to think about the kinds of uh, uh, techniques and incentives that people might require to move them in the right direction, be it 
a healthier diet. In this case, the focus is physical activity. And there was a recent report. I think it came out in Nature, didn't it? it the, the first author is Milkman, like the guy who delivers the milk. And uh, it was, they called it a mega study. It was a bunch of not so small studies, but on different behavior uh, change techniques. The senior author, the last author, there must've been 50 of them on the paper is Angela Duckworth. And she's noted for her work on grit being an important component of personality, how people get things done, how they stick with things like exercise that a lot of people don't stick with. And that's why health clubs can oversell their memberships, right? Because you, you have good intentions and you know, it doesn't always work out. Like 50% of the time, it doesn't always work out. So she and her colleagues, the 50 scientists there did uh, uh, studies where they looked at monetary incentives. They looked at social support. They looked at digital nudges that you can get on your smartphone. Yeah. And they rank yeah. ordered them in terms of the effect on uh, adhering to a protocol over a few months. Uh, these were uh, memberships that people got at health clubs. How often did they go? And the health clubs, you have a little card and you, you kind of sign in. So you've got objective data, which is great. Not objective data and how much you walked or what you did, but at least objective data, did you go to the health club? And presumably, presumably it's not just to drink coffee, I hope, but you know, it's to actually use the machines and do some things. So that study just came out, I think the end of 2021. Uh, but there are lots of studies that focus on um, uh, various incentives, uh, psychosocial factors that enhance uh, well-being and uh, that provide and get rid of some of the obstacles. People will often tell you, in terms of physical activity, oh, I'm tired when I come home from work, or I can't get to the health club because uh, the tra public transportation is not good enough. And, you know, in Boston now, we have a new mayor, uh, Mayor Wu, who's trying to make uh, the public transportation free. Well, boy, would that help for low income people rather than having to pay a couple of bucks to get to the health club, whether it's the T or the buses in Boston, and then, and then try to get home. So I think there are things we can do, we can all do uh, to change the support structure, to remove the obstacles, to provide incentives uh, for people to become more physically active, uh, provide families with free passes for state and federal uh, uh, recreational areas, forests, so they don't yeah. have to worry about that. Gas is already so expensive, so any obstacles you can get rid of. I think we as scientists need to be better communicators. Uh, I've participated uh, in a number of um, components of the Alan Alder Center for Science Communication, which is was founded at Stony Brook University over a decade ago. This is our Hawkeye from MASH, uh, said he would have been a scientist if he wouldn't have been a yeah. successful actor. And yeah. he's helped with fundraising. He's provided his own financial resources. And, you know, the, um, the training I've gone to and gotten involved in is fantastic because it's not done by scientists. We're not the best communicators. Mm -hmm. So uh, one group that I was invited to a few years ago, uh, one of the uh, instructors comes in and they're usually like two day really intensive uh, training on your feet, in your face. You know, how do you deal with people that don't agree with you? Uh, and, and uh, you know, how do you convince them without belittling them and, yeah, and making yeah. them feel that they're, they're dumb, they don't know the science. And uh, one of the instructor comes in and she says, uh, said, Art, we, we've met in the past. And I said, oh, OK. So I think we met online. It was Katie Couric's producer. Huh. And uh, so they have TV producers. They have actors and actresses. What a wonderful group uh, to learn from, because these people are professional communicators. And then I came back to the university here and I was I, when I was still was the senior VP for research. And I started a program for our graduate students and our postdocs during the summer, and I wouldn't hire even one scientist. So I hired theater professors, and there are a lot of good theater in Boston. And I would go to the initial meetings, and then we'd have a curriculum, much like the Alan Alder Center. How do you communicate effectively? A lot of role playing. Uh, you know, people that disagree with you. You don't need to talk to people that agree with you. They agree with you. So how do you convince people? So, so does the Alan Alder... So on their website, do they have like videos that are that they have some videos they have, uh, of course, they have more, much more online things than they used to. They used to be in person, which was fun, too. And, and, and if you were there, Mark, you'd be assigned uh, you, you could be assigned to either side. So you could be Mark, the anti-vax proponent. And <laughs> you, you had to argue you had to essentially 
be convinced based on science and all of the communication techniques that maybe you should get your kids vaccinated. Uh, so I played on both sides of this, which was really fun because you, you have to think about, so how would somebody think who, who, would, who would be anti-vax or uh, you know, anti-climate change and, and, and a variety of other things? So uh, it, it was fun and very informative because you don't often put yourself in somebody's shoes. What you say, what I say is, yeah. how could they be so stupid? Why could they, you know, there's plenty of good evidence. Well, that's not the right way to communicate. And, yeah. and I've never done that, communicated but like that. But I think for us as scientists to get out there and not just go to scientific meetings, I mean, that's fine. That's how we learn from our colleagues. But I've done more and more work where I've gone to community meetings uh, and, and uh, talked to people uh, I would never use a term like BDNF or IGF-1 or VEGF or telomeres, but you talk to them in, in lay language, assuming that most people have had high school science and, you know, okay. and maybe they don't remember a lot of that. So let's, let's start there. And uh, my dad, for example, had a ninth grade education. He was, he actually taught uh, calculus at college, which was amazing for a guy because he was self-taught, but, but huh. there aren't, I have to remember, there aren't people like my dad. I don't know anybody else like my dad uh, who could teach it. He taught at Hofstra University and he had a ninth grade education because he was really good at math because he loved math. But, you know, I'm, I'm afraid there aren't many people like that these <laughs> days. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, we don't all have to get PhDs to, to learn about science or math, but, you know, often that's the way it works. So I think we have to become better communicators. I think we have have to start with our undergraduates and, and graduate students who are in STEM professions. Uh, I think scientists have to get better. You know, I talk to many colleagues that, that, that think they're good communicators, and then they try to give a, a, a talk to a, a community group and it falls flat. Well, because you can't talk like you're talking to colleagues. The, my favorite presentation I ever did, it's before I left Illinois and I was invited up to Chicago to a big uh, assisted living facility and uh, memory clinic for uh, AD, Lewy body, on and on and on, disease patients, hundreds, probably thousands of patients. And I was going to talk to the medical staff and I get there and I had my nice presentation all put together, you know, that we give to people that are medically trained that know some of the things we know. <laughs> and they tell me and uh, they said, well, we've made a slight change. And the slight change is you're going to talk to the Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers. <laughs> So I had to pivot on a dime and I just closed the computer. I sat on the desk yeah. in the front of the room. I yeah. walked around the room and we talked about their concerns and what they wanted to know. And I can tell you there weren't, there were, I think there were probably not any scientific jargon in, in the two hour conversation I had. But, you know, most of us don't get the opportunity to do that. They actually invited me back. They said, you did a great job. I said, I guess I got lucky because, you know, I, I, didn't, I would have planned, you know, if, if you talk to a very different group. I, at Northwestern, they have a huge Parkinson's clinic and they had me come there and I knew I was going to talk to 400 Parkinson's patients. Okay, that was a different kind of talk. And I had never seen all the symptoms of Parkinson's, which are quite varied in one place because they're, they're usually not in one person. But uh, they also had a neurosurgeon talk about deep brain stimulation and stem cell transplants. And about 50 patients came up to me, many in their walkers, after the, the, the talk I gave, which was about exercise. And Parkinson's patients can do exercise too. And there's, yeah. there's evidence there that that can be helpful in many ways, dance and, and aerobic exercise and so forth. Even non-contact boxing has become popular, moving your hands and feet in a, in a coordinated fashion. And these people came up to me afterwards and they said, well, Professor Kramer, we really enjoyed your presentation. We, you know, we like listening to the neurosurgeon too, but we, we would prefer to try something else first. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, you yeah. Sink some electrodes into my brain, guys. <laughs> yeah. So I think people are receptive to this, certainly patients and, and caregivers, yeah. but also parents and, and kids, if you can frame it in the kind of language that they're familiar with, not, not to dumb it down, but just to be receptive to what they know and build from there. Yeah, I think yeah. we all need to be, and I think all our graduate students in molecular, cellular biology, neuroscience, psychology, whatever, you know, where we're interested in lifestyle, we need to be required to take communication courses yeah, and not think that we're good at it because we're not, no. <laughs> not, yeah. not in general. Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, Art, uh, it's been great talking with you today same here 
and hope, hopefully everybody will keep exercising or if they're not exercising, get some aerobic exercise, walking's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Get, get out in nature and uh, you'll do your brain good. Yeah, and, and also restrict a few calories would be good. I've gotten involved yeah. with the group of the USDA Tufts and uh, I'm a, a committee member of one of their PhD students who should finish next month. So I've been learning a lot more about caloric restriction. They have this study called calorie that they've been doing. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And uh, I've helped them work with some data and, uh, and also diets. It's in there. Yeah. Well, I'll get a copy. Yeah. So that's like to know uh, more about it. Intermittent fasting angle. And uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I don't need to do a podcast on this uh, for this series because there's all, already a bunch of stuff on the <laughs> web people can find. But I'll, pu yeah. I'll put some links to some of your work in the discussion, maybe a link sure. to that, that Alan Alda yeah, abs uh, absolutely. Website. And so people, if they want more information, maybe more details on studies mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, they can find it there. Yeah, and people, you can uh, please put my email. Either I, I'm emeritus at Illinois, so that email stays active until I kick the bucket, or okay. my Northeastern email. I don't care, whatever. I'm happy to respond to people's questions. Okay, I'll put your email in the, in okay. the uh, de description thing on this YouTube channel. Okay. Well, it's been great to talk to you and and best of luck with all the books. It's fantastic. You got one out and one's at the publisher already. Yeah. Well, thanks, Art. Uh, it's been great again. And uh, we should keep in touch. I'll I'll send you some information on those. Well, thanks. Exosomes, yeah. Exosomes, and, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.